thanks for saving me. Come on, let's head back to the tribe. No. I'm sorry, what? Why the hell would I go back with you? Your tribe enslaved me and forced me into labor. You and your friends just beat me with sticks the other day. Yes, but now that you killed the monster, there's a chance that our leader will let you join our tribe. So, what you're saying is that you want me to go back to the people who enslaved me for just a chance of freedom when I could just leave now? Yeah. What is up YouTube, my name is Gio, and The Book of Boba Fett is the worst piece of Star Wars media since The Rise of Skywalker. The plot is all over the place, the show uses nostalgia as a replacement for substance, and it takes a once fan favorite character and turns him into someone unrecognizable. Now I understand that comparing The Book of Boba Fett to the literal antichrist that is the sequel trilogy may seem like a stretch, but trust me when I tell you it really isn't. This show not only fails in every aspect of storytelling, but it also insults its audience's intelligence. It makes you wonder how did one of the most beloved characters in Star Wars end up being a part of a series that makes me want to violate the Geneva Conventions. Well, sit back as I try to explain how the Book of Boba Fett failed its audience. Now for context, the show follows Boba Fett after he has taken control of Jabba the Hutt's territory on the planet of Tatooine, and intends to become the head of a new crime family, or Daimos. However, he has to deal with rival gangs and politicians who want to take his newly acquired power from him. The plot isn't crazy complicated, so I'm sure it has minimal issues. <coughs> now, with a title like The Book of Boba Fett, you would assume that Boba Fett would be the most fleshed out and important character, right? Well, much like my parents when my report card came in, you should prepare to be disappointed. Because by some stroke of impossible stupidity, Boba Fett is one of the few characters I know that have gotten worse the more appearances he makes. Really let that sink in. This man has had 4 minutes of screen time throughout the entire Star Wars movie saga, with Two of those minutes being from the original trilogy. Two minutes, four lines of dialogue, better than a whole ass series. Yeah, we're in for a painful ride here, ladies and gentlemen. However, despite the lack of time, back then, we were still able to get some insight on Boba Fett's character. He's a damn good bounty hunter considering that Darth Vader hired him to help capture the rebels in The Empire Strikes Back, and it was even singled out when Vader said no disintegrations, so he's clearly not afraid to kill. Keep that in mind. Plus, even though he got cheap shotted by Han in Return of the Jedi, he still came across as pretty intelligent, as seen when he hid within debris to track down the Millennium Falcon. So we got a great bounty hunter who's not afraid to kill and beat tier intelligence. Is that clear? Great. Okay, now I want you to take those traits and throw them in the trash because none of those apply to this imposter. This is not Boba Fett. He is soft only kills as a last resort, and has sub-brick intelligence. And I would also like to take this moment to say, hey Disney, can you grow some damn balls and let your ruthless bounty hunter, I don't know, actually be ruthless? I mean, old Star Wars used to have limbs being cut off, a mature tone, and unknowing incest. With Disney Star Wars, we get no lost limbs, the maturity of a toddler, and technical incest. And look, the problem isn't that Boba Fett is a complete misrepresentation of how he was characterized in the past. Okay, that's a lie. It is. But the bigger problem comes from the fact that there is no lead up to this change. For context, the show opens up with Boba in the stomach of the hentai monster from Return of the Jedi. Once he wakes up, we actually get some ingenuity and grit from Boba as he fights his way out of the pit. Sure. I would have liked it to be a bit longer, maybe even have him try several different gadgets before he succeeds. But so far, this is a good start. Unfortunately, due to exhaustion, he ends up passing out, right before a bunch of Jawas come and ransack his armor, weapons, social security number, and apparently, his character. As from this point forward, we will never get another scene that shows Boba in any threatening or favorable light. For example, after the Jawas strip-search him, he was found by the Tusken Raiders, 
who wasted no time in enslaving and dragging him through the desert to their tribe. Once they get there, Boba immediately tries to escape once he sees an opening, but fails thanks to this f***ing snitch. However, this doesn't deter Boba, as he's still talking about it the next day when he and the other slave are brought by one of the Tuscan children's to collect these water fruit things. Unfortunately for everyone here, they end up uncovering a desert monster, who looks like the offspring of the Pokemon Machamp and Kecleon. Hey, 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 stop. Anyway, Kekchamp over here ends up killing that rat bastard of a snitch and was about to do the same to the Tuscan kid, but Boba does his best Christian Grey impression and chokes out the monster. Now let's stop right here and look at this situation. Boba has been trying to escape this entire episode and now he is alone with a Tuscan child he can easily overpower. So does he A. Take this opportunity to escape, B. Beat up the child for revenge and then escape, or C, go back to the tribe and hope that they set him free because he saved their child. Uh, C? <sighs> no, Timmy. Uh, are you stupid? That was clearly a fake answer. I mean, there's no way someone would be that brain dead as to- Are you kidding me? You're telling me that these people enslaved you, dragged you like a rag doll, forced you into manual labor, and had a bunch of Oompa Loompas beat you with sticks, and you decided to go back for a dice roll of freedom? They could have easily enslaved you again. These tribes have a history of killing slaves in the Star Wars universe. What the hell are you thinking? Because you're stupid. But this is a better Tuscan tribe. Ah yes, straw man, I remember all those nice southern slave owners that beat their workers. Yeah, it's in history books, right before the chapter about how Stalin wanted to become a damn priest. The old Boba Fett would have dipped as soon as he had the chance, especially after he's been trying to do so the entire episode. This is what I mean by sub-brick intelligence. Like, look at this scene from later in the same episode. Boba and his right-hand woman, Fennec Shand, are on their way back from collecting a tribute from one of the bars in their territory. When, out of nowhere, a wild group of assassins appear and surround the two with energy shields. Out of respect for my last surviving brain cell, I'm going to ignore the fact that if just one of these assassins had a gun, they could have just easily Oswald Boba Fett. Instead, let's look at the situation that our protagonists find themselves in. They are in the middle of this circle of energy shields, and Bulba's inventory consists of a small grappling hook, a wrist-mounted missile, a flamethrower, knee rockets, and a jetpack. So, I think the solution here is pretty obvious. I mean, the clear answer to being surrounded and having your only escape plan be up is to shoot your wrist-mounted missile point-blank at the shield. God. At this point, I'm pretty sure the creatures I would find in the Cretaceous period would have a higher cognitive function than this walking vegetable. But it can't get worse, right? The writers must have gotten better over time, right? A street gang of insolent youths has been stealing my inventory. And your inventory is water. I grew up surrounded by water. Oh my god, okay. At first glance, this may seem like a nitpick, but it actually says a lot about how this show wants to characterize Boba Fett. For context, at the start of episode 3, this man comes to Boba to ask him for help, as a gang of misfits have stolen water from his business and he wants them to be taken care of. Boba agrees to sort this out and goes to confront the gang. Their leader Drash, who has just as bad of a design as the rest of these crimes in nature, lets Boba know that they can't pay for their own water because of the spice trade, as there's no more work for them. So Boba offers them jobs as his bodyguards. This annoys the owner of the business, and he asks for compensation for his water. And this following conversation perfectly embodies Boba's incompetence. What do they owe you? 1,300 credits for water. Gee, I wonder why water may be expensive on this planet. I, I, I can't imagine why water would cost more. My god, were you dropped on your head when you were a child? The interaction ends with Boba barely giving any compensation and essentially telling him to piss off. This whole scene is wrong on so many planes of existences, with the main issue being Boba's philosophy behind his leadership 
is as inconsistent as trying to kill someone by flipping a penny off the Empire State Building. You say you want to rule your territory with respect, but this man was just trying to defend his business. That money could be used for his family or how he survives, and yet you reward the criminals that robbed him. You could have given him proper compensation and still have given the Transformers here jobs. But Geo, he was being a dick. Shut up, Timmy! I would be a dick too if you tried to steal water from my store, especially if I live on Tatooine. I mean, the planet is drier than a nun's pussy. Why is Boba shocked at the importance water plays in its economy? Hell, it actually seems like he has no knowledge about the territory he's supposed to control. So, you have no knowledge about the state of your territory, its economy, and your morals are inconsistent at best? Actually, never mind. He would make a perfect politician. You are fake news. However, while Boba Fett contradicting his prior characterization is really bad for this series, it's not aneurysm territory just yet. Now, we get that in episode 4, where the show tries to rewrite Star Wars history. Most of the episode is a flashback to when Boba first met Fennec, and the two team up to get his ship, Slave One, back from Jabba's palace. Now, in the original trilogy, Boba never had any bad blood with Jabba, so I became confused on why he was trying to sneak in to get his ship back. Luckily, he ends up explaining this to Fennec, and I'm just gonna let what he says speak for itself. I was left for dead on the sands of Tatooine. I was rescued by the sand people. If the ship is yours, why don't you just ask for it back? Without my armor, I'm less persuasive. I'm gonna kill that bloated pig who double-crossed me. The Tuscans took me in, made me part of their tribe. Excuse the f out of me? Okay, there, there is so much wrong with what he said that we need to break this down nice and slow. First off, you were left for dead or double-crossed. That would imply that Jabba and his crew knew you were alive after you fell into the Sarlacc pit. Explain to me when they were supposed to come back for you, considering that half of them, including Jabba, are dead? Like, what would you want from them? Fish you out of the pit in some hopes that you may have survived the 95% chance of death? Secondly, I can understand being cautious without your armor. But are you telling me you didn't at least try to make some kind of contact or negotiate to see if you could get your ship back? I mean, they didn't sell it, so they might have some respect for your property. Or better yet, you are a world-class bounty hunter. You must have some context on Tatooine to help you out. And lastly, come closer. No, no, it's okay, it's okay, come closer. Yes, yes, it's good. The Tuscans did not save you. They enslaved you, beat you, and only let you join them because you were in the right place at the right time. I have seen less Stockholm Syndrome in NFL players' girlfriends. Like, are you f***ing dumb? This is what I mean when I say that Boba Fett is not mm. Boba Fett in the show. He is soft when he's supposed to be strong. He is stupid when he should be smart. And is as consistent as my upload schedule. The show relies on you not remembering this character's history in the movies. So they could sell you this dollar store version. We are just getting started and I am already losing my mind. Well, maybe the plot makes up for the crappy characterization. Oh, my naive viewer. How nice of you to assume that this series has a plot. And when I say that, I am not being hyperbolic. The definition of a plot is the main events of a play, novel, movie, or similar work devised and presented by a writer as an interrelated sequence. And after watching The Book of Boba Fett twice, I can safely say that the main plot beats have as strong a connection to each other as Jada has with Will Smith. <laughs> Things just happen in this show for no proper buildup or reason for it behind the writers just thinking it was a cool idea. For example, let's rewind a bit back to episode 3, where we are introduced to the Hutt twins that claim they have ownership of the territory Boba is trying to rule. He obviously refuses to give it up, so in the middle of the night, while he is soaking in the back of the tank, the hunt sent a very skilled Wookiee bounty hunter named Chrysanthemum, Chrysanthemum, Chris Hansen, uh, I don't know, to kill Fett. Unfortunately, he fails and ends up being imprisoned. Even with how short this sequence of events are, there are still loads of problems that need to be addressed. The most obvious one being, how the hell did this Wookiee get to Boba in the first place? Keep in mind, this is the same episode where Boba recruits the Ex Machina gang members. 
So you were trying to tell me that this seven foot three beast was able to sneak into the palace and avoid two Gamorian guards, four Hot Topic gang members, however many droids that are wandering around, and frickin' Fennec? I'd have a better chance believing that this oversized mutt used a force to get to Boba. Well, Gio, he's a skilled bounty hunter, so obviously he'd be able to avoid detection. You know what? You're right. What? Yeah, if this Wookiee was a skilled bounty hunter, it does help in understanding how this was possible. The problem is that if he was a skilled bounty hunter, then why didn't he kill Boba when he was given several opportunities to do so? Look, here he could have choked him out as soon as he opened the pod, same applies to this interaction from a few moments later, and here, Boba should be dead. A Wookiee has the power to rip off entire limbs in seconds, so how the hell did Boba survive? Scenes like this, while small, are proof that the writers are willing to put any cool idea they think they have into the plot without creating any build up to that story beat. Like the writers decided that it would be cool to have a Wookiee fight scene, so they added it without thinking about how incompetent it would make several characters look. Or they want to give Boba Fett his own rancor, just like Jabba. So how does he get one? Well, remember those Hut twins? After their botched assassination attempt, they go to Boba to apologize and say that they are going to leave the planet. As a token of their apology, they give him a baby rancor. I'm sorry, time out, flag on the play, personal foul, what? You spent all this time, money, and energy to try and hold on to your claim of land this entire episode, but now you just want to leave because it's quote, bad for business? Or better yet, why is Boba letting this slide? How many attempts on your life is it going to take before you firmly plant a Tim up someone's ass? This side plot with the huts adds nothing to the story, and leads me to believe that the writers just wanted to give Boba a rancor, but couldn't be f***ed to figure out a way for it to happen naturally. You know what, here, let's rewrite this episode real quick. Have episode 3 be focused on Boba checking out the workers district of Mos Espa. Maybe after he tries to hire the amputee gang, they refuse at first, as they don't trust Boba because of his past. So he goes to that district to check out their situation, and we get to see how run down the area is. We can see Drash and her gang all huddled around a small house, confused on why Fett is here. After some questioning, they can inform Boba that ever since the increase of the spice trade, the workers district has barely been surviving. Many of the people either end up using the spice, becoming too unmotivated to work, or quit their jobs to start selling it for fast money. This will be reinforced to Boba when he sees a group called the Pike Syndicate start to threaten a local kid who is giving them a hard time about bringing Spice into the district. If you've watched Naruto, think of this kid having a similar energy to Komohamaru. The encounter can end with the Pikes threatening to release a rancor on this district if the people don't cooperate. This will anger Boba as he sees a little bit of himself in this kid, and it leads him to getting involved to stop this group of Pikes. During this fight, the Pikes will release the Rancor, and through some quick thinking from Boba and help from Drash's gang, he is able to tame the beast, which will cause the remaining Pikes to flee the district. Now after this is all said and done, you could have a moment where several people get upset at Boba's actions because of how easy it was for them to make money off the Spice. Boba can promise them that he will bring work back to this district, but the people won't believe him because in the past, Daimos like Java only took advantage of them. However, Drash can then vouch for Boba, saying he could have ignored the problems here and just stayed in his palace. But he made a choice to come and help, and I for one don't want to see our homes get any more crappy because of this spice. This will be enough to convince the people of the district that Boba is on their side, even to the point to where one guy reveals that it was the mayor who gave the Pikes permission to run their spice here. Drash then can pull Boba to the side and apologize for judging him based on his past, and ask what he's going to be doing about the Rancor. Boba can then say, I'll take him back with me. As a Daimo, I want my family to be about new beginnings, a fresh start for anyone or anything, even you and your friends. Drash can give a quick smile and say, I think we'd like that. Thank you.
Look, I ain't no professional writer, but this new concept ends up solving a lot of the plot and world building problems that the show tries to hide from you. It gives Boba a chance to learn more about the territory he's ruling over, provides some characterization for Drash and her friends, gives the spice an actual effect from the story, don't worry I'll touch on that later, and makes it so that the Rancor's existence in the story is beyond just wanting a Rancor. This may seem like I'm nitpicking here, but this is a small example on how the writers put no care into the story. There is no overarching plot that connects these episodes, so it makes everything feel disjointed and all over the place. I mean, they try to make the Pike Syndicate the villains for the season, as they massacred Boba's Tuscan family back in episode 3, and are currently selling spice throughout Tatooine, but they only play a role in the story for 3 episodes. And honestly, the Pikes aren't really villains. Yes, they annihilated an entire tribe of Tuscans, but to be honest, f the Tuscans. These guys have been shown to enslave innocent people, sometimes even beat or kill them, and have been doing so for generations. Maybe it's my cold, dead heart, but you can't just show me a Tuscan kid and expect me to feel sympathy for when the entire tribe of slave owners gets killed. However, the bigger question mark that I have when it comes to not just the Pikes, but the overall world building in this show, is about Spice. For those of you who may not know, Spice is pretty much the cocaine of the Star Wars universe. And throughout the Book of Boba Fett, we are constantly told that this Spice is destroying Tatooine. The problem with this is that we don't see the negative effect the Spice has on this planet. Yes, we are told it's bad, but if you're not going to show us, then how are we supposed to believe that this is an important issue? I mean, give me a junkie on the street or something. By never seeing the effect Spice has on Tatooine, it makes it that much harder to have any stakes for the story, as we don't know what would happen if our heroes fails, which kills any investment in the story. So we have a plot that has no stakes, no proper cause and effect, and no overarching goal. You see what I mean when I say this doesn't even meet the definition of a plot? Now, some of you may be thinking to yourselves, Hey Gia, why is it you only covered 4 out of the 7 episodes of this section? If you're going to cover the plot, shouldn't you cover every aspect? Well, you see my dear viewer, I would. If those episodes actually push the plot forward in any meaningful way, you can cut out all of episodes 5, 6, and even half of 4 from this season and nothing would change. Why is this? Well, because clearly Boba Fett isn't popular enough to have his own show to explore his character. Nah, he needs help bringing in an audience, which is where episodes 5 and 6 come in, or as I like to call them, yeah, for some bizarre reason, which I can only assume was the result of a drunken night at the Disney office. The next two episodes follow Mando from The Mandalorian. We pick up immediately where Season 2 left off, where Baby Yoda or Grogu is training with Luke, while Mando is trying to get his own affairs in order. The sad thing is that these episodes are probably the best of the season. <laughs> Ain't that some sh**? Boba Fett isn't even the highlight of his own damn show. You're still a failure! However, these episodes are still filled with their own unique issues, that while not doing extreme harm to this show, does do damage to The Mandalorian Season 3 before it even comes out. So screw it, we're already here, let's sidestep the self-destruction of this show to look at the complete sabotage of another. A perfect example of this is the addition of the Darksaber, which is really just a regular lightsaber in every way, except whoever wields it is respected as the ruler of Mandalore. <laughs> But for some bizarre reason, the writers decide to make it so that the blade gets heavier if it's out of sync with the user? I mean, I guess that's okay, it's not like we have seen several other instances of both force and non-force users being able to wield the blade fairly easily without it getting heavier. It gets heavier with each move. That is because you are fighting against the blade. It's heavier than I thought. Two, three, four. It's pretty clear that this new nerf was added just to give Mando a reason to ask Ahsoka or Luke to help in learning how to use the saber next season. These writers are willing to break the rules of established canon just to give us a little more nostalgia bait to keep us around. And 
This was a trend with both episodes 5 and 6. They will even break the rules they established in The Mandalorian itself for that sweet dose of nostalgia. Mere existence puts Mandalorians at risk. Mandalorian steel is meant for armor, not weapons. Ah yes, only armor. Whistling birds are a powerful defense against multiple enemies. Only armor. This was obviously done to not only give Mando a reason to visit Grogu with Luke in episode 6, but because now that Mando has the Darksaber, the spear is seen as kinda pointless. I for one would love to have the option to either slice my enemies in half or skewer them like a kebab, but to each their own. I can talk about the issues that pertain to the Mandalorian for hours, because during my research for this video, I fell down a rabbit hole of contradictions between the Mandalorian culture and the history before and after the creation of this television series. But I'll save that for a future Mandalorian video. So the last thing I'm going to discuss in this section is how the Book of Boba Fett completely undermines the ending of the Mandalorian season two. For context, at the end of that season, Grogu and Mando part ways so our favorite green midget can go train with Luke. This was a big moment for the show as these two have built up a great bond during the course of both seasons and have been practically inseparable. So having them apart would have been a very interesting way to switch up the formula for season 3. However, sensing the conflict within Grogu, Luke gives him a choice, either stay and become a Jedi or go back to Mando and become a Mandalorian. Considering that I'm even mentioning it in this video, it should be pretty obvious what he picked. What? Oh. Okay, little guy. I'm happy to see you too. What could have been a catalyst to an interesting dynamic for season 3, where we could grow these two as individuals and see how they are dealing with being separated from each other, ends up getting resolved over the course of one episode. This show is going to break me. It's trying to please the fans in the most surface level way possible. Oh, people like Grogu and Mando together? Well then we can't have them be separated next season. Fans love the Clone Wars? Well let's bring back Ahsoka and Cad Bane. What's that? You haven't seen the mere 10 episodes of the Clone Wars that had Cad Bane? So you're massively confused on who this Smurf inbred is and how he has a history with Boba Fett? Well f you, we're Disney. We don't expect you to think. Actually, while we're at it, what about Luke, R2-D2, the marshal that used to have Boba Fett's armor? Stop! It's, it's time to stop. I'm sorry, I may be crazy, but last I checked, wasn't this supposed to be a Boba Fett show? What does any of this have to do with his character, his journey, or his development? Nothing? Oh, I'm sorry. My mistake. I forgot. This isn't the book of Boba Fett. It's the book of every other Star Wars character. Please watch our show. Featuring Boba Fett. Why in the ton ton f is this fan favorite character getting sidelined in a series that has his own damn name in the title? How bad is this you may be wondering? Well, a real crazy person would go back and skim through every episode to figure out roughly how much screen time we get with Boba Fett that aren't flashbacks. So, after I ran the numbers, I determined that Boba Fett had a grand total of about 119 minutes out of a season that has a 300 minute runtime. What? This is your main character and he's only in half of the show? But well, why didn't you include the flashbacks? Because nothing that happens in those sections pushed the plot or Boba's character development forward. What kind of spice are you on that you actually sat down in the writer's room and said, hey, hey guys, look, you know how we're supposed to make a Boba Fett show, right? Well, what if, now, now hear me out, what if we didn't? Amazing, amazing, round of applause. <laughs> like it actually boggles my mind. Episodes 1, 3, and 4 have half the runtime taken up by flashbacks. Episode 2, the majority of it was a flashback. Episode 5 was Mando and his supporting cast, and Episode 6 was a cluster of different characters. The most time we get with Boba in the present affecting the plot is in the finale. And man what an atrocity that was. This may be the worst finale for a television series I have ever seen. For context, leading up to the finale, Boba is preparing to go to war with the Pike Syndicate. So he enlists the help of Mando, Chrysanthemum, Chrysanthemum, Crescent, Black Wookiee, the people of Mos Peglo, 
Freetown. What? It's called Freetown now. I'm sorry, Freetown, any other three crime families. However, the Pikes are one step ahead, as not only do they send Cad Bane to kill the Marshal of Freetown, but also get the other three Daimos to turn on Bulba and his allies. Everyone is scattered, trying to figure out what's their next move, leaving Bulba and Mando pinned. These two then proceed to have the most boring last stand that has ever cursed my eyes. Why are you two landing in the middle of the fight with no cover? I know this is supposed to be the all or nothing moment, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't take an advantageous position. Then again, it doesn't seem to matter, because the Pike Syndicates clearly went to the Stormtrooper Academy for battle tactics. Not only do they take turns shooting, even though it's a 2v, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and they could clearly overpower our armor clad Nimrods, but none of them think to aim at the limbs that aren't covered by Beskar. I mean, look at this! You're telling me no one was able to hit an unprotected body part? Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think the pikes could hit water if you had dropped them in the ocean. Because when reinforcements end up coming to help Boba and Mando, the Syndicate have several wide open shots that they just can't land. F*** me, look at this. How the hell were Ewoks with sticks more accurate than a gang with guns? So we have practically invincible protagonists that refuse to move while fighting blind enemies. Truly an exciting finale. <laughs> but would you believe me if I told you it gets worse? That's impossible. Yep, because after our heroes hold off the pikes, they are greeted by these big ass droids with energy shields. Now, let's imagine we're in this situation, right? After about 10 seconds of shooting at these droids and realizing that your blasters are useless, you'd stop, right? You'd reassess the situation, right? You wouldn't keep shooting at the droid, right? God, what is wrong with you people? More shots have been fired here than during D-Day, and you haven't changed your strategy? Oh, so now the clankers want to tap my patience, huh? Why wasn't that your opening move? They were all behind the same piece of cover. You could have wiped them all out in one blast. <sighs> okay, keep calm, Gio. All right, I'll bite. How did our heroes come out on top? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so they won because Boba was able to control the Rancor, even though he has no training in it? I want to learn to ride this one. It will take a tremendous amount of discipline. The following Thursday. <laughs> if you excuse me for a second, I need to get a drink. God, I needed that break. Okay, where are we at? I've known you a long time, Bobo. God damn it! Yep. The show's final conflict is a showdown against Boba Fett and Cad Bane, which I'm sure confused a good amount of you for several different reasons. People that watch this scene fall into one of several categories. You either one, have no idea who Cad Bane is and are completely confused as the writers don't try to explain anything about him or his history with Boba, two, have seen at least one of the 10 episodes Cad Bane was in during the Clone Wars cartoon, but don't understand his connection to Boba as they never interacted in any episode, three, you not only have seen every episode that involves Cad Bane, remember the one that he shares a single look at a kid who we later find out was Boba, seen the unfinished unair episode where Boba duels Bane, and are currently sitting next to your IG-88 body pillow. Or finally, you just accept everything Disney feeds you without giving it any amount of critical thinking. I'd assume these people also think WandaVision, Loki, and Shang-Chi are well made. Yeah, that's right, I said it, you clankers. You can't just insert a character as the final boss during the season finale if you don't explain who the hell they are. We should have had Cad Bane be the main antagonist for the show. You could still have him be hired by the Pikes, but have him be a recurring part of the series. Then instead of the Tuscan flashbacks that add nothing to the story, we can have flashbacks to the time Boba spent with Bane and develop their relationship. So when we finally get to this showdown, it's a battle that has been built up to throughout the season, 
rather than just something that comes out of nowhere, like a speeding car or a giant dick. In the end, Boba kills a fan favorite character, who let's be honest, only got popular because of a cool design and voice actor. Fennec kills everyone who betrayed them, and the season ends with the two walking the streets of Mos Espa, being praised and loved by the people. Despite the fact that they caused immense collateral damage to the district, potentially destroying several homes, and most likely created a power vacuum by killing the other Daimos without replacing them, which will lead to probably more bloodshed in the future. But who cares, because the mouse says shut the f up and consume our product. <sighs> the Book of Boba Fett is one of the biggest failures I have ever seen come out of Disney Star Wars. A character with such a cult following should have been a layup. However, all it did was remind me of one truth that will remain true for years to come. Disney just can't write legacy characters. They can't. Every time they have tried, they either assassinate their character or change them to the point of being unrecognizable. Now we can cross Boba Fett off that list and they are not gonna stop. How do I know this? Well, for one reason. There is a singular point I have not brought up yet as it's proof that not only can Disney not write legacy characters, but also they plan on doubling down on their prior screw-ups. You know him, you used to love him, Luke Skywalker. And more specifically, this scene, where Luke gives Grogu a choice to either stay with him and become a Jedi, or reunite with Mando and become a Mandalorian. But then he says this. But you may choose only one. If you choose the armor, you'll return to your friend, the Mandalorian. However, you will be giving into attachment to those that you love and forsaking the way of the Jedi. This right here is the same f***ing scam Disney tried to sell their audience with The Last Jedi. In the original trilogy, Luke was motivated by his attachments. They're what made him get in that X-Wing and destroy the Death Star. What gave him the courage to try and save his friends from Cloud City without being fully trained. And are the reason he was able to bring Darth Vader back to the light. Even if we assume for some backwards ass reason, none of the Force Ghosts told Luke that the Jedi Order and their customs of having no attachments was a major contributing factor to Anakin's fall from grace. Luke would have never taught or enforced this lesson to a student, purely based on his own past actions. This isn't Return of the Jedi Luke Skywalker. This is Last Jedi Blue Milk Drinking Jake Skywalker. Disney has doubled down on their new interpretations of our beloved heroes, and it just makes you wonder, why? Why can't anybody at the House of Mouse keep a character with a history consistent? Well, the answer is sad, but it's actually quite simple. They don't care. They don't care if the audience knows these characters are inconsistent. They don't care if they contradict the films we grew up with. The Star Wars canon is so vast and expansive that nobody wants to double or triple check that the character they are using is consistent across multiple mediums, even though it's their damn jobs. You're telling me that Disney doesn't have enough money to hire three people with an internet connection to fact check your work? This incompetence has ruined all of our old heroes, and at this point, not even the high ground would be able to save Obi-Wan from the same fate. The Book of Boba Fett is not only an insult to its audience's intelligence, but doesn't even care to fit within the existing Star Wars universe. Such a beloved character deserved so much better. But at this point, I think we can all agree that maybe it would have been better for everyone if Boba just stayed in the Sarlacc pit. But what do you guys think of the show? Did you guys like the Book of Boba Fett? Did you guys not? Let me know down in the comment section down below. Yes, this video is finally done, and boy, has it taken years off my life. I have had to learn 3D animation, I have to, to learn 3D modeling, rigging, it, it was a mess a lot of the time. I ended up in the hospital, it's, it was crazy, it was crazy, but it's out, and I truly believe this is one of my best videos I've ever made. No, no, it is the best video I've ever made. But yeah, thank you all for being really patient with me, and thanks to this experience, I will never have a video take this long again, because I'm learning, I'm getting fast, faster, I'm making this stuff, and a lot of the models are future-proof, and if not future-proof, I can tweak a little bit that won't take as long, it'll just take a day. But yes, I got two videos that I'm going to be working, working on at the same, same time, 
One is going to be the long-awaited Naomi video, and the next one is going to be a little bit, a little bit of a secret video, something that could, could hopefully add some variety to the channel, if you will. A different, different style, something to really flex my creative muscles. But other than that, once again, thank you all so much for your patience and support. If you guys like the video and new to the channel, hit that like and the subscribe button. Also, didn't you show the potential? Hit the same buttons. Anyway, my name is Gio, my voice is going, and we'll talk to you all later. Peace.